Hi, this is Dennis Hancock, Forage Extension Agronomist at the University of Georgia in the Crop and Soil Sciences Department, and this is the fourth part of the Legume Management in Georgia presentation. This section of the presentation focuses in on forage yield expectations and animal production response that we would expect to see with some of these legumes. In the coastal plain region, we can expect uh, clover yields to be somewhat variable. And I'm going to step you through some examples here of some yield values, but I want you to can think about this in the back of your mind, uh, also from the standpoint of year-to-year -year variation. And what I'm going to show you here is actually three years worth of data from South Alabama. Uh, this is broken down now for annuals and uh, perennials that would normally be grown as perennials, but for the most part in South Georgia, these are going to be grown as uh, annual crops, although uh, some of them will be more productive at coming back from seed than others. But you can see that, uh, for example, burseam clover gives us the highest total yields overall, but there's a distribution there in terms of what time of year that it actually is going to be most productive. Whereas uh, burseam and crimson clover produce very well during the early months, February and March, uh, something like arrowleaf clover really doesn't hit its stride until April and May. Same thing could be said, for example, for red clover. Uh, it's one that doesn't do very much in February and March, but in April and May, and even into June and July, red clover does fairly well for us. So overall, those yields can be very high. What we should also point out here is that uh, these are yield totals, and this is an average over three years, but there's quite a bit of variability that will occur from one year to the next. And I'm going to hopefully focus you in here on bursting clover. For example, the variability that occurs, and if I, I talk about this in terms of the number of V's that are here, um, what basically I'm meaning by that, the more V's that are in a column, the more variable that yield is going to be. So, for example, bursim is extremely variable from its standpoint of overall productivity, especially in April and May time frame and in the June-July time frame. Whereas something like arrowleaf and crimson are much less overall, much less variable. Arrowleaf may be very variable in the early stages. Uh, crimson may also be because of weather. But generally speaking, overall they have very relatively low variability with regards to their yields. Well, I'll point out here that red clover actually is a fairly consistent uh, performer for us. Although it's primarily going to be uh, producing here late and its late productivity is oftentimes subject to whether or not we're getting uh, June and July rains, it does perform better for us uh, during that time uh, uh, of the year. It's more consistent from that standpoint. Now let's look at the Piedmont area. And again the same uh, concept here of the number of V's indicate the more variable that they are. This time we have three years and two locations rather than the previous situation where we had three years and four locations. If we look at the average yield now splitting this up between before March 31st and uh, a total yield. Now this was done at uh, Athens at the Plant Science Farm in Athens and then also at Edenton. And if you look at the average there uh, you see that red clover does very well, arrowleaf clover does very well for us, um, but generally speaking crimson is going to give us the best uh, early yield distribution. If we look at the variability that exists here, now early yields are going to be quite variable in the Piedmont. It's really unheard of to have reliable productivity out of these annual clovers uh, during that early production season. But overall, we can see that crimson, for example, is very stable in its overall production. Uh, generally speaking, we can get about 3,000 pounds uh, out of crimson stands. Whereas some of the others, particularly bursim and subterranean clover, are going to be much more variable, much more variable for us. 
Let's look at the effect of that annual clover addition to uh, coastal Bermuda grass yields. This work was done in Starkville, Mississippi. But basically the bottom line of this graph is that uh, by adding the legume into the system, in this case there really wasn't a clear difference between crimson or air leaf, and then comparing that to something with no clover but at the same additional amount of nitrogen fertilizer, we see on average of about a 3,500 pound increase. Now this is very uh, important for us in this day and age to be able to get that extra yield for basically the same amount of nitrogen that's being added. If we really look at the addition of these annual clovers and what they're putting into the situation into a Bermuda grass hay field, generally speaking they're going to be adding about a hundred units of nitrogen per acre on average. So let's take a look at that in terms of the value of that annual legume establishment. Generally speaking, if we talk about just general values for the cost per seed, now these actually may be slightly on the low end for, for what you might have in your uh, particular farming operation, but um, I think this is useful to use these as kind of a baseline guide. If we look at both the cost per pound of seed and then also translating that into a cost per acre, using the respective seeding rates that would be appropriate of that in adding this now to a ryegrass overseeding situation where we're going to be adding that uh, overseeding our uh, Bermuda grass anyway what value does that have for us then? Well let's take a look at this in a little bit more depth with regard to how much nitrogen would need to be produced to cover this cost of seed production or seed addition to the system. Well to do that what we would do then is take the cost per acre in terms of the seeding cost and divide that by the value of the nitrogen that would be derived. In this case we're going to value a pound of nitrogen at 75 cents. So in the case of arrow leaf clover uh, $12 per acre divided by 75 cents uh, per pound of nitrogen is going to give us a value uh, or excuse me, a, a amount of nitrogen that needs to be produced to break even for that cost expenditure of 16 pounds of nitrogen. Now obviously there are other costs that need to be considered here, but this is a, a little bit of a simplification, but I think it does illustrate the, the amount of nitrogen that would need to be fixed. Now you recall earlier that I said that in many cases by adding these annual clovers, especially air leaf clover and crimson clover, and also red clover for that matter, we can expect about 100 units of nitrogen to be added per acre. In general, that can range anywhere from 50 to 110 and from 70 to 140 for the arrow leaf and crimson and 50 to 130 for red clover, a late, much later maturing variety or species. So what I'm basically showing you here is that almost assuredly we're going to get more nitrogen back than the cost of uh, adding that legume to the system. So this is a very valuable way of adding nitrogen to our forage system. Let's talk a little bit about feeding versus grazing systems and specifically uh, you know we have a lot of interest in uh, pasture finished beef operations and other aspects of that and legume management fits very well into controlled grazing in management intensive grazing or sometimes called rotational grazing. The efficiencies of these grazing and, uh, and also I'm going to compare this against uh, mechanized harvest methods uh, vary quite widely. For example for something like contigu continuous stocking which is basically where the animals have continuous access to the pasture at a set stocking rate. Uh, they're not rotated around among different paddocks. Uh, generally speaking, for every 100 pounds of forage that's produced, only 30 to 40 of those pounds will make it into the animal. That's not a very exciting efficiency value. In fact, if you told that uh, to a average row crop producer, for example, they would be very unhappy with 70% of their crop being wasted in the field. 
but uh, continuous stocking systems are very inefficient. But if we add in just a little bit of rotation among different paddocks, uh, whether that be a slow rotation or even a more moderate rotation, we drastically increase um, the amount of efficiency that we're gleaning out of that pasture. And then under strip grazing or very intensive kinds of systems, and I'll lump in here a very intensive management intensive grazing MIG, uh, this could also include um, uh, the frontal grazing techniques where we're grazing off a little bit at a time and making very efficient use of that crop. In those particular settings, we're getting 70 to 80 percent of the value of that forage that's produced is actually making it into the animal. So that's a drastically in increase. And if we compare that to mechanical methods of harvesting forage, uh, specifically hay crop production, which generally speaking is going to be in the 50% range rather than the range that I show here, but generally speaking uh, it's going to be quite variable based on curing conditions and uh, feeding and storage losses and so forth. It also compares very well against silage systems and green chop systems, for example which also require a lot more energy, a lot more time, and labor and expenditures. Now one of the key concerns that we have for using legumes in pastures is the potential for bloat. Now bloat is a buildup of trapped gas inside the rumen of the animal. It causes a foamy layer to occur inside that rumen that prevents gases from being eructated or belched out of the animal. As a result, what eventually can happen is those gases build up to the point where the animal can no longer uh, inhale and exhale um, into their lungs and they can actually suffocate to death. This sometimes also can occur on small grains too, so it's not something that's just limited to legumes, but it oftentimes is a problem on legumes. Now there's some very key preventative measures that need to be employed here. First, don't starve these animals out and then turn them out onto legumes when they're hungry. That will cause those animals to gorge themselves on the legumes and will cause this rapid buildup of uh, uh, this foamy layer and trapped gas. It's also important, I think, to include a mixture of forages in that animal's diet. Um, to include something that's a little bit more fibrous that can balance out the, um, the compounds within the legumes that are going to be causing the bloat problems. The addition of monensin or some other ion for is also very helpful in uh, preventing the buildup of that uh, uh, foamy layer. Uh, that soapy, foamy kind of layer uh, really can be um, battled against with the use of an ionophore or monensin or something like proloxylene or blow guard uh, which is uh, going to help control the, con the conditions that exist that cause that foamy layer to occur. Now let's look at the effect of annual clover on the number of grazing days that a cow-calf unit would see on coastal Bermuda grass. Again this is a three-year average from some work that was done in uh, Alabama. If we look at a combination of rye, cereal rye grown with arrowleaf clover and crimson clover, we can see that they've added about 90, uh, or excuse me, about 100 units of nitrogen uh, in addition to that. And now this is being added to the coastal Bermuda grass after the rye has occurred, or after the uh, uh, winter annuals have died out, excuse me. Now we've gotten a very long period of grazing here from January 8th all the way over to October 5th. So a total of 600, or excuse me, 268 days altogether. Whereas with arrowleaf clover and crimson clover com combined, we didn't add any nitrogen to the, the coastal Bermuda grass in this study, and we ended up with 211 days of grazing out of this. Interestingly, when we have ryegrass alone, and we've added a fairly substantial amount of total nitrogen, 
we still only ended up with 240 days of grazing. Of course, all of that is better than adding nothing at all, which uh, where we'd added that 100 pounds of nitrogen only, we didn't get to start grazing on the Bermuda grass until April 6th. And in this case, we only had on uh, uh, less than 190 days worth of grazing. So what effect does that have on the animal performance, on the cow-calf performance? Well, if we look at that same exact study and looking at the calf and the cow data, the cows basically held their own on the rye and airleaf uh, crimson clover combination. And compared to the ryegrass alone and no annuals, they did fairly well with respect to that. Interestingly here, this arrowleaf clover and crimson clover combination really statistically ended up with a very superior uh, gain on those cows. In other words, those cows were able to maintain more body condition on that particular combination than anything else. Now, we also saw greater daily gain on the calves on these cows, okay? So, in generally what we saw was that when we had clover in the mix, we had at least as good as with ryegrass alone and sometimes uh, vastly superior. In fact, this was quite a bit more significant or highly significant, uh, the difference between um, having the rye and the clover combination versus a ryegrass alone. Uh, that 90 pounds worth of difference per acre makes a lot of difference in the bottom line there. Again, this is over a three-year average, and in each case, far superior to the gain per acre accomplished with no annuals whatsoever. I just want to emphasize with this particular table that what we've seen in the literature from, from other locations is that the broadcast or drilling method really has very little impact on the bottom line in terms of animal performance. And in fact, oftentimes it really doesn't matter uh, all that much as to what uh, species that you're mixing in here. In this particular case, we had ryegrass and white clover versus ryegrass, uh, white clover, and crimson clover uh, added into the mix for some earlier grazing. Overall, I didn't see very many significant differences at all in this particular scenario. Now another additional benefit of adding specifically something like white clover to tall fescue pastures is that it lessens the, the effects of the endophyte infection in that tall fescue. Here's some data from several years ago now uh, where they had toxic tall fescue that had nitrogen applied versus Durana and Regal. Okay, those two white clover varieties that I mentioned in the previous section as being quite different in how well they persisted. Now this is after a, a significant amount of time. This is after four years of growth in that pasture. So there's still quite a bit of Durana left there uh, in this particular scenario and you can tell that in the gains uh, and the differences between average daily gain between those and also in gain per acre. So very much an important aspect not only to choose the right variety but to look at it in context of the overall forage production system. Now let's look at the effect of clover addition on the productivity of beef steers when we're talking about endophyte free fescue. Endophyte free fescue does not have the toxic alkaloids being uh, formed in it and if we apply 60 pounds of nitrogen generally speaking we get at right at two pounds of average daily gain. And a gain per acre standpoint about 383 and a gain per animal of 213 uh, with a stocking density of 1.8 animals per acre. In this case we're talking about, I believe this was um, five and six weight steers. Now if we add in ladino and red clovers or white clover, uh, a large type of white clover and a red clover into the system with no nitrogen, what we see is that we also see an increase in average daily gain, gain per acre is basically holding steady for us. Gain per animal may actually be increased a little bit, uh, although we have a slightly lower stocking density. But note here with cereal rye 
uh, an annual clover and ryegrass, they were able to maintain gains of 2.5 pounds per day, a gain per acre of 513 pounds per acre, and 241 pounds of gain per animal. Uh, this is significantly different from uh, this area uh, with uh, fescue and just 60 pounds of nitrogen. Also note that we were able to increase the stocking density on these uh, particular acres as well. Now let's talk a little bit about stocker performance on alfalfa. This is some data from uh, several years back now um, from here in Georgia where we were looking at differences in um, forage allowance. Now this is under continuously stocked pastures. This is not rotationally grazed. This is continuously stocked at one, or basically one steer per acre, a steer and a half, or 2.35 on, on average. Now this is averaged over a three year period and that's why we're getting some of the goofy uh, uh, numbers in terms of stocking density. But if we look at the average daily gain when we're giving it a, a tremendous amount of forage availability, uh, we're getting quite a bit of gain uh, per animal. But if we look at the gain per acre here, this is really the story. We're looking at the maximizing the amount of gain per acre. And in this particular case, the lower forage allowance actually maintained more gain per acre. Again, that was because primarily because of the stocker uh, stocking rate, the continuously stocked stocking rate. Now let's look at alfalfa. Now this is rotationally grazed alfalfa compared to high tannin or low tannin Cerisia lespedesa. If you recall from the previous section, I talked about Cerisia lespedesa's uh, propensity to have fairly high tannin content, which makes that forage less uh, palatable to that animal, uh, and also, uh, but also has some positive effect effects from the standpoint of bloat and also from the standpoint of uh, deworming properties uh, associated with Cerisia lespedesa. But irregardless, if we look at the gains per animal, uh, we see an advantage to alfalfa, although the low tannin, we, see, we did see a statistical difference here between the low tannin and the high tannin. And then in terms of gain per acre, this is a small difference, but it was st statistically different but the gain per acre from the alfalfa standpoint was very dramatic. And the final weight of these particular animals uh, reflects uh, a fairly uniform uh, amount of uh, body weight, but again, depending on the stocking density and the gain per acre. So I appreciate your time and attention about legume management in Georgia, specifically talking about our old friends, the legumes. And I encourage you to check out some of our other website resources, whether that be the Management Intensive Grazing website or also our general forage webpage called georgiaforages.com. Uh, this webpage has a lot of different information about uh, establishment issues, those are species that are adapted to our region, fertility, pest management issues, and so forth. So I encourage you to check that out online as well. With that, if you have questions, I encourage you to, in addition to the website, to call your local county extension agent at 1-800-ASK-UGA-1 anywhere in the state of Georgia. That will put you in contact with your local county extension office.